All right, so what questions do you guys have for me this week? So from the start of each week, we're going to just open up to questions, whether it's questions you have from other shifts, or if there's a topic you want to talk about, or anything like that. Can you go over the proper way to do a uh, Sperling's test? I remember last quarter, there was some kind of confusion yeah. over which way to turn the head, and then how the positives for that would diff would be different yeah. from um, cervical compression. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, so um, what are we trying to get at with, so what do you know about Sperling so far? That I think it's, you're trying to compress like, like the facet joints as opposed to like the uh, intervertebral discs with mm -hmm. uh, compression. Um, and that it's just like, you're trying to get like maximum pressure with like all the motions on the facets. Correct. So the uh, Sperling's test is also known as maximal compression test. And basically what we're, we're doing is we're putting the neck into a position that is going to maximally compress the facet joints on one aspect. So with our movements, we know that extension compresses the facet joints, right? We know that if we rotate to the right, we get compression on which side? The right. The right. Left. Compression? Yeah. Like vertebral compression? Facet. Facet compression. Facet compression. compression, yeah. It's counterintuitive to what you think, but when you look to the right, you're closing off the contralateral side, not the ipsilateral. <clears throat> and then when you laterally flex, you're going to close off the ipsilateral side. Mm -hmm. So our Sperling's test is going to be contralateral rotation. So if we're going to test the right side, mm -hmm. so we rotate to the left, we extend, and then we laterally flex to the right. Then from there, first thing I do here is I ask the patient if they have any pain. Because right now, the facet joints on the right side are already compressed, right? We can then add compression by adding in our actual compression. And you're gonna to want to not compress down to the floor, you're compressing through the spine, right? Because we're in this position, you don't push down because that's going to cause the head to go like this, you push this way. Mm -hmm. So you're basically pushing towards C7, T1 junction because <clears throat> you're wanting to load the spine through the spine not at an angle. So if we have uh, ipsilateral pain, what can that mean? Facet syndrome. Facets, right? If we have contralateral pain, what could that mean? Muscle strain? Strain. Generally, I think more ligamentous, more ligamentous, right? Because if we are maximally compressing the, uh, the joint on this side, we are maximally opening it on the other side to some degree. We still have the extension part of it, which slightly closes off deficit joint. And so technically, if we were going to open this side maximally, it would be this, this, and this. That's maximal opening, okay? Um, but we are, so we're getting more insight into the joint capsule, into the supporting ligaments, um, the ligaments that are going in between uh, each level that are separate from uh, the actual joint capsule and things like that. Basically, things on this side that are going to get uh, stretched. Now, <clears throat> what if we do that on this side and we get pain that goes down into the arm? Um, what else is nerve root impingement? Nerve yeah. root impingement. Because remember, that motion there is also going to be closing off the intervertebral foramen, mm -hmm. which is where the nerve roots are coming out and then going down and forming our brachial plexus. And so if we get a radiation into the arm, we think nerve root. What happens if we get radiation into the posterior shoulder? Superficial, cutaneous. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. so. With the with the spurling yeah. motion. Uh, well, I mean radiation is nerve root. Right, so it would be nerves, like cutaneous nerves. Mm -hmm. Would it have to do with the uh, the cervical plexus on that mm -hmm. side? Yeah. 
Still the facet joints. Remember, the lower facet joints can refer to the door, the posterior aspect of the shoulder. So sometimes we have that local pain, but if the if and and generally what you'll see is that if a patient comes in and they say, "I have neck pain and it's in this region here," when you test facet joints, that's where they're going to feel the pain. If they come in and they say, "I have pain in the back of my shoulder," and then you're doing your evaluation because remember, with the shoulder. The things on the back of the shoulder generally come from the neck. So a patient comes in and says, I have posterior shoulder pain, it's generally coming from the neck. Um, and so you do your assessment and you recreate this pain with spurlings. To me, that's a positive, even though it's not local pain. It's still a positive because we know that the lower facets can radiate to the posterior aspect of the shoulder. And we're testing the facets, so we recreated that. Same thing if patient feels it up here even behind the eyeball, okay? All of that can be the upper cervicals and then the uh, lanto-occipital joint. And so uh, you just have to remember those pain referral patterns when you're uh, doing your tests. Um, another example of that is uh, patients who are having knee pain, but it's actually a referral from the SI joint. You've had this patient mm -hmm. before. When you test the SI joint, if you recreate your knee pain, to me that's a positive despite the true positive being low back pain because you just stressed that joint and you recreated their knee pain. So you treat this, this goes away. Um, so then with our, just our straight cervical compression, which is just gonna be here, we're, we are getting more compression of the actual discs. And so if you have uh, patients who have uh, a disc bulge that's encroaching on a nerve root, you can worsen that which could then cause their radiating symptoms into the arm. Um, if they have an annular tear and you compress that annular tear, that could cause local, more diffuse, um, and generally it's felt a little more midline pain. Um, and then that would be supported with your other physical exam findings, which is going into flexion is going to worsen a, uh, a disc bulge or an annular tear because that's compressing the front side of the neck and and pushing things to the back side <clears throat> and then would get better with extension whereas facet syndrome is going to get worse here and better here um, and then with cervical compression again you can still have uh, local pain on the right or left side for facets because you're still compressing and loading the facet joints gotcha. so uh, generally uh, if a patient is older or more fragile, I'm, I might not even do spurlings because if I think they have facet syndrome based off their history and other physical exams such as when they look up, like they can't look up because it's painful or mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really limited and I come in here and I just do compression and they have pain on this side, that's enough. I don't have to put them into a terrible position that will hurt them a lot here in order to elicit that because I've already elicited with um, with compression and so it's a um, I believe I'm saying this right it's a less uh, sensitive test Spurlings. For, no Spurlings is a more sensitive more test okay. because it will pick up smaller pathologies of the facet joints because you're maximally compressing gotcha. putting in a disadvantaged position okay do you need a, a radiating symptom in order for a spurling to be positive? No, it can be local. Yeah. So when it comes to treating a positive spurlings, um, do you, you know, go straight for injections, or would you, you know, consider, you know, could a muscle strain elicit a similar response? Could uh, possibly, you know, necessity of a chiropractic or osteopathic uh, mm -hmm. care elicit the same response? So th this is my, exactly. <clears throat> my general framework for this is um, I've specialized into my area, right? I, what resonates with me is doing regenerative injections. And so <clears throat> while there's uh, other things out there that are uh, important and, and beneficial for that healing it's just not the avenue that I go down now so and and generally uh, most patients who come to me understand that because they've either been they've seen me on social and so they I talk about that and so they know that or they've been referred by someone that I've helped which I help them with injections 
And so, uh, so my approach, if that patient is wanting to work with me, is we're either going to do uh, a con so let's say it's a, a positive spurlings and everything else fits facet syndrome, then I'm going to do facet injections, whether it's with prolo PRP or stem cells is uh, just another clinical decision. But I'm going to treat the facet joint, I'm going to treat the capsule, I might treat other supporting ligaments and things like that. It's not that these patients wouldn't ever get better with another therapy, it's just that that's the therapy that I do. And a lot of the patients that come to see me have worked with physical therapy, have seen a Cairo, like they've done these other things, and that's when they come to see me because they've exhausted the other options. Um, <clears throat> if, if someone comes to me and they have, uh, they have facet syndrome and they've never gone to PT ever, I generally, I refer to PT first. And, um, and sometimes that's in conjunction with injections, depending on uh, basically the patient and how severe it is. And, uh, you know, what it's, if they're, if it's super, super debilitating, they can't get out of bed, they can't do their job. I'm not going to say, okay, go do PT for three months. And if that doesn't work, let's do an injection. It's more like, hey, let's do the injection and get you in PT right now. And so that factors in. So I think PT is uh, definitely beneficial, but a lot of the patients who come to me have done PT. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I actually just had a, a patient that I treated on Friday who um, she's had a, a lot of concussions, so a lot of head injuries. And so she has cervical instability that's basically causing uh, chronic, chronic headaches and neck tension, which is now it's basically spreading and it's developed into she has bilateral thoracic outlet syndrome um, that's functional, it's not structural. She doesn't have like a seventh uh, cervical rib, but all the muscles are just clamping down around her neck because of the cervical instability that she has. And she has seen a Gonstead chiropractor, a Nuka chiropractor, and she's now with a regular chiropractor, but she just always has to go back to see them or her symptoms, like she can't keep her symptoms in check. And even after she goes to a Cairo, her pain will go from an eight out of 10 down to a four out of 10. So the best she's ever had in the last four years is basically a, a four out of 10 on her on her pain. And so, and that's nothing against chiropractors because I, I have Cairos that I refer to, but that's just one of the things I think about with the injections, if they continually need to have an adjustment, they continually need to have a massage then that tells me that there's something deeper that's not being addressed, which can sometimes be addressed with the injections. So then I was uh, a new student on the case and they uh, were still having this pain and um, the wrist exam was pretty unremarkable. Like there was no physical exam I could do that recreated pain in the wrist. I went and I did spurlings and I put the patient into spurlings position and that recreated their wrist pain. Okay, so this patient was never going to heal from treating the wrist. They needed their neck treated. Okay, and so yeah, every every upper extremity case I evaluate the neck. Every lower extremity case I evaluate the low back. Um, and so the question then becomes, I don't really care where they perceive pain. I more so care about what structure is causing them to perceive pain there. And so if in that case they perceive pain in the wrist. I could treat the wrist all day with injections and it would never have done anything except for the placebo effect, right? If I go and I treat the neck, that's when we actually have a chance to resolve what's going on in the wrist. So for your shoulder question, if they're coming in, they have posterior shoulder pain, but I, did, I even if they have, let's say, Supra is positive on testing and they have some mild tearing on an MRI on Supra, I still think it's the neck because the way that the our brain perceives pain is that pain on the posterior aspect is come it's likely coming from a facet joint in the neck and that's just been so well documented not saying that a super can't ever refer pain to the back it's just so uncommonly uh, rare compared to facets referring to posterior shoulder yeah do you have a quick shoulder question then we're going to go into a valve all right, so last week we, we had touched on performing um, a uh, hug up for evaluating shoulder pain. Yeah. And we said that, I remember you, you mentioned weakness um, could indicate two things um, a full muscle length tear, full thickness, full thickness tear, yeah. or, or axillary nerve compression. Could you explain 
how that how that um, is or you know where that compression is going to be happening with, when we do this test. <clears throat> so the compression can happen anywhere along the nerve path. Okay, um, but what we um, the what I build that off of is the nerve path mainly the nerve path. And so we know that the axillary nerve pierces through quadrangular space, which it has to go through a uh, fascia to get out. And so that is a common, common area where we have axillary nerve entrapment is, uh, is through quadrangular space. And that's why with all axillary nerve impingement syndromes, I'm treating quadrangular space, whether that's just palpation guided or preferably ultrasound guidance. Um, the other area that it can you can have entrapment is so you have the axillary nerve Zach. <laughs> so you have the axillary nerve piercing through deep through quadrangular space, and then that is going to give off a branch called the superior lateral brachial cutaneous nerve. That is going to come off in about this spot right here which is, this is the posterior deltoid here, coming down right and touching the tuberosity. And it's gonna come out uh, at the border, the intersect basically between triceps and the posterior deltoid. That then is going to wrap around and can go all the way to the front side. Now there's also a, a branch of axillary. So axillary, right, you know, the, uh, is gonna wrap around and then you can, you can have a branch off of axillary that actually comes up the front is, and what supplies the anterior aspect of the shoulder. Um, and so the, <clears throat> when we talk about nerve injuries, the two things that I'm looking for is where can I get trapped by fascia <clears throat> or compressed by fascia? Um, what muscles does it travel through that if we have a chronically uh, hypertonic muscle that it can, can be squeezing on it? A good example is that sometimes the uh, the cluneal nerves, as they're coming from basically the, the rami, that they can pass through the erector spinae group. And so the most common location that they go is in the fascial plane in between, and so it's less of a chance of that happening, of compression happening. But if it goes through the actual muscle, then there's a potential for, if that's chronically hypertonic, that that can constrict enough on the nerve to cause issues. Mm -hmm. And then the other is uh, basically uh, friction injuries or, or bony uh, landmarks that nerves pass over that can then, you can have friction of the nerve. And so a good example is greater and less occipital as they're crossing the occipital ridge. With this mo movement, you can get chronic friction because you've got the bony protuberance sticking out. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that can contribute. So, but for mm -hmm. the shoulder, it's basically where the superior lateral brachial cutaneous pierces through that superficial fascia, or axillary nerve pierces through the deep fascia. <clears throat> and so, even though supraspinatus is not innervated by any branch of axillary nerve, that's mm -hmm. suprascapular, if I remember correctly, which doesn't have any sensory component to it. Um, what other muscle are you using with a hug up? Test. Deltoid. Deltoid. Right? You can't you can't not use deltoid in this test. And right. so that's same with speeds tests, right? Speeds test is classically a biceps uh, tendinosis test, but what big muscle group is right here, right. you're also right, anterior is deltoid. anterior deltoid. And so when we have weakness on speeds test, that's when I really start thinking that we have an axillary nerve issue because why would else would that be weak? Yes, it could be the uh, uh, damage, but it's more likely a nerve issue. Uh, thank you. So yeah, really know the, the <coughs> path of, of the nerves, and that can add to our clinical yes. you know, assessment. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so you have neck pain, right? Okay. Do you want to do a quick eval on you? Uh, up here, so probably about C two three on the. So you want to actually face this way then? <coughs> yeah. Where? Sorry. Uh, C two three on the right up here. Okay, so we know, so unilateral so far, so already I'm starting to think, okay, uh, less chance that it's discogenic, right? Because discogenic, generally it's gonna be felt either bilateral or it's gonna feel more midline or it's gonna feel more diffuse, not uh, as much <clears throat> unilateral. And so already I'm thinking nerve 
the set. Those are kind of the, the two things. Um, when did this start? Uh, it's been on and off for a few years now. Uh, any injuries to the neck? Mm, nothing that I'm aware of. I had some mild whiplash in a car accident last year. Okay. Um, do you remember when you that accident happened? Were you looking straight forward? Were you looking? I was in the looking in the mirror, saw it happen, so I tensed up a little bit. Okay, so that's important when you're also thinking about potential uh, injuries. Is his neck would have been turned a little bit before the whiplash, right? And so that could, right? Because if he's looking this way, and then the whiplash happens this way, then that's potential to injure this right side. Okay, so again, I'm still thinking nerve. I'm thinking maybe the joint capsule facet because that could get damaged uh, in that whiplash. And then uh, nuchal ligament also, levator can also get uh, injured with that. Um, generally with levator though, if it's lower levator, that's gonna be, generally the pain's gonna be in this region. But if it's upper levator, right, it's gonna be up here. I definitely get some pain in here a lot, pretty <clears throat> often, so. Okay. Um, what movements aggravate it? Um, you know, I haven't really figured that one out. It's more so just, it's just there. I know I just get a lot of muscle tension right in that area and it just gets locked up on me. Okay. So, so turning any particular ways, looking up the ceiling doesn't really mm, bother it that much? No. No, it's pretty good with that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so... Uh, general flow here is that we'll do uh, compression, any pain? Mm -mm. Distraction, any pain? Mm -mm. Okay, look over left. That's usually something that I'll have to do to make it feel better is some distraction. Okay, anything here? No. Anything here? No. Okay, so we'll do spurling, so look, extend, flex, any pain here? Uh, nope, but there's a little, actually, yeah. A little bit? Very, very slight in the back here, and I, it almost feels like it's inside my head. Okay. <clears throat> and now, super important when you get a positive, is that the area that you feel your pain? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that was almost pressure in my eye, it felt like. Okay. So that, and again, the upper cervicals can refer to the anterior, the lateral aspect and uh, behind the eye. So what we'll do then is let's come back to that spot. Here and then I'm still gonna apply a little pressure. Does that increase or change the pain? No change. Okay. Uh, look, extend, flex. Anything here? Mm -mm. Okay. And apply. Anything there? Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, then we're gonna go into some palpation. Yeah, I'm actually getting like a really kind of a low grade headache after that. Okay. So. So again, that can be common with when we're doing our orthopedic testing because we're, again, we're trying to find that pain generator and when you find it, you can aggravate it. So we'll palpate nuchal ridge. Any tenderness? Mm -mm. Okay, so our big nerves that, we're, that I'm evaluating for along the nuchal ridge is going to be the greater occipital nerve, which comes off of the C2 nerve root and upwards, and then lesser occipital, which lesser occipital comes from the uh, cervical plexus, which is a, uh, the plexus that comes from uh, the anterior division of C2 through C4, or C5, I forget. Okay, um, I always, always, always palpate the SPs, because what attaches to our SPs? That was a little tender, that nuchal, nuchal ridge. Nuchal. Nuchal ligament, right? And especially when we have uh, the whipl prior whiplash injuries, I need to know if the nuchal ligament's involved. Any tenderness? Uh, right in there a little bit, just a little bit towards the left. Yep, the great right there's a little tender. Okay, so that's not on the SP. That's more so uh, lateral on, on the pillar slash the uh, rectors there. Okay, um, then we go and I always check our superficial cervical plexus, which uh, remember if we take mastoid process to sternum, it's about halfway. Any tenderness here? No, not too bad. Okay, and then how about on the left side? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. So there's more on the left than the right. Mm 
Okay, so that's to me an incidental finding, which just means I don't factor it in too much because he's not complaining of left-sided neck pain. So you have to be careful not to think, oh, I pushed on something and it hurt, so therefore I must treat it. It's more just that. What I'm looking for side to side is if he had more pain here on the side that he perceives pain and less pain on here, then I think it's more nerve involvement contributing to his pain. But the fact that it's not, then I'm less likely thinking that uh, we have an issue with uh, the cervical plexus. How about up here? Mm -mm. Okay. So um, that's basically how I'm going to walk through a cervical exam. And so my, my uh, DDX would be an upper cervical uh, uh, facet syndrome. Um, with some joint capsule involvement as well. Just the joint capsule involvement comes from the, the past injury, right? Where we had a, uh, a mild whiplash, which could contribute to that uh, irritation of the actual capsule. So I'd treat you with some Perlo or cool. PRP okay. into the neck. Okay, thanks. All right. Any questions about the flow of that or the testing? And you, you didn't need to so much assess the shoulder in that case because nothing was radiating to the shoulder and there was no reported shoulder pain? Yeah. Right. In general, in a full, full ortho exam in, in practice, I will. Um, but it's when you've got upper cervical that refers up to here, right. it's less, less, less likely that it's going to be shoulder. Mm -hmm. Do you choose um, Pro-OPRP as a treatment um, instead of perineural because you suspect the... Uh, the joint capsule involvement, or regardless of that, you would do PRP Pro anyway? Um, so it's more so that because I think there's joint capsule and actual joint structure that's involved. Um, I have, so because the joint capsule is innervated by the medial branch, which then also we have that branch that goes out to the skin as well. And so through Hilton's law, you can improve the pain of a facet joint with doing perineural mm -hmm. and we've seen that over and over and over again it just sometimes we don't get that full resolution and so we might do three or four perineural treatments and then we eventually have to go to pro or prp um <clears throat> or uh we we end up getting it but it just takes a lot longer to treat okay. um and so if we did a perineural on him today we'd likely see a reduction in his pain and his tests would improve it would just likely come back because I think there's an actual uh, capsular issue involved. But generally in clinical practice, I'm easily just, I'll do the actual joint injection and then I'll come just at the very end with some perineural and I'll just do kind of four, five spots mm -hmm. in the neck there just to get both ends of the equation just because I think it's beneficial.